November's resolution for the NFL Public Forum topic is going to be Resolved, the benefits of domestic surveillance by the NSA outweigh the harms. As usual, brief overview, then going to look at the wording, then going to look at some of the background, then some specific arguments. Brief overview, this topic was taken from the headlines in June. Not a whole lot has happened since then that's big in the headlines, but there certainly have been a lot of small revelations, both in foreign newspapers and in U.S. courts since then. There's certainly a lot of current and changing evidence on this topic and will be throughout November. Because of the way the topic is worded, Pro has an advantage given how debate judges tend to weigh arguments. There are impacts that exist but are on Pro but are much more nebulous on Con. Overall, if Khan wants to win rounds on this topic, they're probably going to need to find some unconventional way of framing the debate, which allows them to draw bright lines and create contrasts where there naturally aren't some. That said, let's go ahead and look at the wording. So, benefits outweigh harms is fairly straightforward. What counts as benefits and harms is probably going to come down to a question of uniqueness. So, which of these would still be benefits in a world where other agencies were doing surveilling instead of the NSA, which these benefits would go away if the NSA stopped doing surveillance, which of these harms are unique to the NSA, which of these harms would persist without, or are these harms egregious enough to justify no surveillance by any agency if other agencies surveilling domestically would do the same thing. So that part's fairly straightforward. Domestic is worth talking about because domestic can mean different things to different teams. So domestic might mean U.S. citizens. It might mean within U.S. borders. It might mean both people within U.S. borders or one person within U.S. borders or one person suspected of maybe having once upon a time been within U.S. borders or having sent the message through a server which happened to be in the U.S. A broad definition of domestic would originally seem to favor con because it allows more NSA activity to talk about but at the same time, the broader domestic gets, the less it becomes spying on our own people, and the more it becomes protecting against external threats. So there's certainly plenty of program that can arise from that as well. Surveillance is an interesting term simply because it's not what's used in the NSA itself. Generally speaking, the NSA does signals intelligence or SIGINT. That's contrasted with human intelligence, which is what you tend to see done by the CIA, DIA, FBI, other Department of Homeland Security affiliated agencies. If those agencies want to do signals intelligence, they either need to do so through the NSA or get the NSA's permission to do so. So surveillance can be kind of a tricky term because a lot of people who use the term are talking more about the legal court cases surrounding it and less of the act of surveilling itself so one size literature will feature that term more prominently than the other, but both sides will need to be able to do some interpreting on that for blocks. It does say the NSA rather than the National Security Agency. There are a lot of other things that the NSA could potentially mean in a debate round, but none of them are applicable here. Please do not go on Wikipedia, go to the disambiguation page, and look up 30 other organizations that have N, S, and A as their acronym because none of them conduct domestic surveillance. Please. So let's go ahead and talk about a little bit of history going from the present on backwards. So right now, this is in the newspapers because of certain court cases, most of which were triggered by Edward Snowden's leaks this past June that said that there was a lot of aggregate data, metadata, that the NSA was collecting on every single phone call, transaction, and email between Americans. Now, the difference between metadata and specific data is certainly something that is going to get fleshed out in rounds in different ways, but the general gist of it is the NSA is saying, we aren't actually looking at specific details, we just care who talked to who for how long, not what they said. And either we can't pull up specific conversations, or if we can, we need a reason to do so, and we are not going to do so without said reason. Obviously, that would lead to potential for abuse. The question is proving that abuse. There have been at least 20 NSA employees in the past who have been disciplined for 
using specific information the NSA doesn't admit to having to track people, typically significant others. But aside from that, what you're probably going to see is a situation where the NSA has more information than they're willing to admit they have, so PRO is going to be mounting a two-tiered defense. We don't know for sure they actually have all this data, but if they did, they're not combing through it individually. They're looking for patterns in it that they can use to follow up on with human intelligence from the other agencies. Aside from that, the con side is going to either argue that they're collecting more than just the aggregate of this metadata, or that that has its own ways of being abused, has its own ways of violating privacy. There are plenty of marketing companies that would love to get their hands on this stuff and could figure a lot about you from that. So with that out of the way, let's go back a little bit to 2001 because that's when the Patriot Act was passed and Section 215 of that gave the NSA power to collect a lot of information it didn't have before and power to not need a warrant to do so. So that's the lesson was a big expansion of the NSA's powers. There was minor expansions in Patriot Act number two, but the first Patriot Act, Section 215, was where the most of it was. The NSA before that, in 1978, fell under the jurisdiction of FISA, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. And I know the topic says domestic and the act says foreign, but a lot of it was talking about surveillance within the U.S., mainly looking at the various alphabet agencies after Watergate. This was as a result of the Church Commission three years before in 1975. So for perspective's sake, the NSA has been around since 1952. Its purpose hasn't overtly changed since then, but its purpose has changed in a few ways based on these commissions. So for instance, if I am Khan, one thing that I might do is set up a bright line in which I say, the people who created this agency said that if it crossed this line, if it did X, then it would have more harms than benefits to its surveillance. So this agency is only worth keeping around if its surveillance is checked by these things, and that once it does these things that it wasn't allowed to do, as a result of the church commission, as a result, sorry, church committee, as a result of FISA, that at that point the harms outweigh the benefits. Obviously, there's a response to every response. The pro side is probably going to respond to this by saying that that shows there are some harms, but the benefits still outweigh them. And pro probably wants to focus a lot on the fact that there are concrete plots being identified and stopped. Maybe not that many, maybe a lot of them are classified, but there are people out there who want to cause harm to the U.S., and having surveillance of them is important. Pro is going to win a lot of debates on this topic by taking the very controversial and bold position that the U.S. should be gathering intelligence on impending terrorist attacks, and that they think that's a good thing. Obviously, Khan does not want to let Pro dumb it down to that level, but it's sometimes going to be hard pressed not to in four minutes or two minutes. So, what that actually means for the Khan side of that is saying, well, we have definite systemic harms going on right now. A lot of these benefits aren't so clear, aren't so definite, and there's ways of casting doubt on that. For those of you who debated a couple of years ago on the September topic, on TSA security procedures post 9-11. You may remember that there was a lot of talk about the FBI astroturfing terrorist events. Basically, finding somebody who doesn't really like America but isn't aligned with any terrorist group, giving them terrorist connections, helping them develop a plot, giving them a bomb, and then arresting them and claiming, hey, we stopped a terror plot, look at how great we're doing, see how much funding we deserve, we're doing a great job, we've stopped so many plots this month, even if we started over 90% of them ourselves. And that same thing could certainly happen here as well. Another thing to keep in mind on the concept when you're talking about this is the idea of mission creep, which is typically used more when you're talking about specific military objectives, but it's fitting here because the NSA's objectives have become more militarized as time goes by as they start doing more and more signals intelligence for foreign allies, foreign militaries, foreign leaders, foreign enemies, what have you. 
because originally the NSA was supposed to look where we didn't want the CIA looking. The NSA was supposed to focus primarily on deciphering signals. The NSA was supposed to be led by somebody who understood that. Recently, the NSA has been led by generals whose background has little, if anything, to do with what the NSA does, and a lot to do with following orders and working closely with other branches of the military, which is what many people see the NSA as becoming these days. So at that point, you have a group that is spying on at least 35 of her allies' militaries, no, 35 that have been caught, multiple world leaders, every business in the U.S., every citizen in the U.S., and refuses to say whether or not it records the president's emails, conversations, etc. So there's certainly some degree of the mission changing from what it was originally envisioned as in 1952 and restricted as in 1978. So those are some places that Khan can go to build a case from. Aside from that, the idea of oversight is important. There are many side benefits of domestic surveillance that can also be talked about. For instance, domestic surveillance by the NSA has created, either directly or indirectly through investment, a lot of technologies that otherwise would not have been developed the same way that Cold War attempts to militarize space in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s ended up creating a lot of technology that's just got daily use today. So a lot of technology we see used in data storage, technology we see used in data protection, used in privacy, a lot of that comes from NSA efforts in the past, as well as just computing in general. So you get to a situation where there may be benefits that are not directly from the domestic surveillance themselves, but are side effects of it. Whether those kinds of benefits of domestic surveillance is sort of something that's up for framework debates, but it can be an interesting tiebreaker for pro teams in rounds where stuff is fairly vague back and forth and we don't know who exactly has been harmed, we don't know who exactly has been benefited. One other argument that Clash is more direct than that, but is also a little bit less intuitive, is just the link turns that Khan has access to. So Khan can argue that signals intelligence is nice and all, but human intelligence is what actually matters, and there's a lot of quotes from intelligence agency heads, both American and foreign, that would back this up. And you'll see this, for instance, even on local levels with stuff like police detectives. The vast majority of the time, it's not some new forensic toy or some intercepted communication that solves a case. It's the right person at the right time coming forward and saying something or asking the right question in the right place at the right time. So, if this increase in SIGINT trades off with HUMINT, then that creates a problem where you're actually making the U.S. less safe and giving less effective surveillance because if people are turned off by this, are unwilling to work with the NSA, don't trust their own government, become secretive, become paranoid, that creates a situation where you're actually less secure. The other thing that Khan can do with this link turn aside from that is they can argue that, let me see, the easiest way to put this would probably be that when you do that, you cause the NSA to gain a focus from its domestic surveillance in the status quo that cause people to overestimate the technology and underestimate the human element so that even if the human element were to stay cooperative, the fact that it's valued less and the fact that, well, we have a machine that can do all of this causes the human intelligence to be taken for granted and that there is a trade-off there. Evidence exists that says it, but not necessarily specifically in the context of the NSA, especially because the NSA is supposed to be the SIG inside of the equation, and nobody's arguing that there shouldn't be a SIG inside, just that the human side should be prioritized more. Aside from that, the main clash in this debate is just going to be, for a lot of rounds, whether civil liberties are more important than having more data to work with for national security. And that comes down to two things. How well a team can quantify the impacts of civil liberties, and how well the team can tie those impacts back into or weigh them against the impacts of national security. It's kind of hard to prove this terrorist attack would have definitely happened if the NSA hadn't been conducting this signals intelligence on American citizens. It's fairly easy to prove this American citizen is less trusting of his or her government now than they were before they knew this about the NSA. At the same time, 
the second one is harder to weigh than the first one would be once you get past the first hurdle of probability. Overall, like I said, I think that Pro has an edge in this one just because it's very easy to explain why countries should be able to conduct some domestic surveillance. Even if not necessarily all the risk surveillance is good, but the harms, it's much harder to point out a specific wronged party. And even if you do find specific citizens who were unfairly targeted, who had information unfairly exposed, then they'll be seen as exceptions to the rule by a lot of judges until you do a lot of work on that. Again, I certainly don't think this is an unwinnable topic for Khan, but I do think that they have to do more work than Pro, either in terms of a framework of establishing some bright line after which harms outweigh benefits, or in terms of setting up some alternate way of weighing impacts that discounts the possibility of terrorist attacks that are supposedly being prevented by domestic surveillance, whether those terrorist attacks are foreign, domestic, or just completely unknown. If you have other questions on the topic, by all means, shoot me an email, leave me a comment on this video, I will try and get back to you as quickly as possible. Best of luck at all the tournaments debating this topic.